Good, good afternoon. Um, my name's Helen King, and it's my absolute honour and privilege to be principal of St Anne's College, um, and a special delight to welcome you all here this evening. Um, before we hear from our um, very eminent speaker this evening, I'd like to introduce you to two remarkable women. One of them is our guest speaker and obviously is, is here this afternoon. The other, Devaki Jane, in whom these, the, who these lectures are sponsored by and, and named, very sadly can't be here, but we're capturing the event so that we can share it with her. Devaki is an amazing alumna and honorary fellow of this college. After she graduated from Mysore University in India, she came to St. Anne's and to Oxford to complete a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. She went on to become a worldwide renowned academic and writer in the field of feminist economics. She's very wise, widely recognized by many eminent awards for her contributions to social justice not just through her academic work and writing, but also through working with bodies, including the United Nations. We're really sad that she can't be with us due to ill health, but we know that in spirit and intellectually, she's here tonight. So you've all come to hear Sylvia Timale speaking on A is for Africa towards the decolonization of knowledge production. We're thrilled that Sylvia's here in Oxford and it's been, been a delight to start to get to know her and her sister who's with us this evening as well, which is fantastic. She's uh, just recently retired earlier this year as a professor of law at Makerere University in Kampala in Uganda. She's a leading African feminist, multidisciplinary scholar, and was coordinator of the Law, Gender and Sexuality Research Centre in her university. She was also the first female dean of law in Uganda. In 2018, she chaired a committee to investigate the cause and the prevalence of sexual harassment at her university, introducing a zero tolerance policy. So she is beyond a theoretical um, practitioner um, and academic, she's also an activist. She's served on a number of national and international boards, including a global commission on HIV and the law. She's published very widely in her most recent book, Decolonization and Afrofeminism, Afro was the winner of the 2022 FTGS Book Prize. She did her master's, uh, sorry, she did her Bachelor of Law at Makerere and then uh, won a scholarship to do a master's at Harvard Law School. Her Doctorate of Philosophy in Sociology and Feminist Studies was completed at the University of Minnesota. We're thrilled that she's here to speak to us this evening. We're going to hear from her for about 40, 45 minutes and then there will be an opportunity for questions, answers, and I'm sure healthy and rigorous debate. So Sylvia, welcome to St Anne's in Oxford. Thank you very much, Helen. And thank you all for making time to come here this evening to listen to me, I really appreciate that. A big warm good evening to you, Banange. <laughs> Banange is Luganda for my fellows, a term that I shall return to later in my talk. It is both a great honor and a privilege for me to address you this evening on this auspicious occasion, the third annual Debaki Jane Lecture. For this opportunity, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to St. Anne's College here at the University of Oxford and in particular to the principal, Helen King, and others who have made my stay very, very warm and you know, made me feel at home. Edwin Drummond, Jason Fiederman, 
Deborah Walker, and most of all, the indomitable Dr. Devaki Jane, who extended this invitation to me and whom I was looking forward to meeting here today. Devaki, I know you're watching. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and I'm sending you all the love. So I could begin tonight's talk with theories of power, rehashing concepts such as Karl Marx's ideology, or Antonio Gramsci's cultural hegemony, or Michel Foucault's regimes of truth, or Annibel Kijano's concept of coloniality. But I really don't want to send you to sleep. <laughs> Suffice it to say here that Western imperialism present their worldview of reality as the only sensible one, as common sense in order to manipulate and exploit the other. And because colonial logics dominate not through physical coercion, but through the widespread acceptance of their ideologies and practices, they are hardly ever questioned. I vividly remember my wry amusement in elementary school as I stumbled over the strange words that made up the English alphabet a is for apple, and from the tropics, apples don't grow in the tropics. <laughs> I think I first saw, I, I saw my first apple in the 80s. <laughs> I is for igloo. K is for kangaroo. M is for mittens. S is for snow. And V is for violin. Using such alien symbols for learning phonetics, simply defeats the purpose of cognitive learning. If the child has no existing knowledge of the visual symbols and sounds, how do you expect them to correctly name them? Unfortunately, this comical and skewed elementary ABC lesson is reflected in most of the formal learning around the continent, where the students continue to uncritically consume Eurocentric material. The world is, is living one big lie, a big lie with many spin-offs. That lie has been successfully spanned by imperialist powers over centuries. The lie is that on planet Earth, there is one universal correct way of being human. The lie constructs the Western way of thinking, of being, and of doing as a one-size-fits-all model, the default drive for the entire world. It mandates universal conformity to Western ways of understanding and interpreting the world. This includes in education, governance, development, measuring time, quality of life, and so on. Many scholars have written and spoken about different aspects of the big, this big lie. All agree that the big lie and its varied spin-offs converge around the creation, normalization, and sustenance of capitalist relations of production and profit for the West at the expense of non-Western societies. But even as I make reference to concepts like the West, the non-West, or even Africa, I am keenly aware that these entities are far from being homogenous. Indeed, there are several enclaves of non-Wests within the West. For example, racial minorities, queer communities, post-colonialists, Marxists, and so on. And the entity baptized Africa by the imperialists is so rich in diversity that the only common denominator that unifies it is the logic behind the big lie that stereotypes the continent as incorrigibly primitive, underdeveloped, and inflicted with conflicts and gloom. As is true for all untruths, the big lie is spread through the power of language and discourse. Through tools such as mass media, education, religion and law, colonialists <coughs> constructed narratives of the naturalness of white supremacy and black inferiority, male supremacy and female inferiority, heteronormativity and so on. During the second half of the 20th century, the imperialists appeared to retreat from Africa with the formal lowering of colonial flags and ceremonial independence parades. However, they had utilized seven and a half decades of colonial rule 
to firmly entrench the lie through the globalization of Western values, norms, and knowledge, all in the name of civilizing the dark continent. During this time, they systematically put in place structures and mechanisms that sustained their domination, even after losing a physical presence in post-independent colonies. Today, the colonial machinery has successfully woven a totalizing ideology that penetrates all aspects of African lives. Through knowledge production and dissemination, this machinery exercises powerful and insidious forms of hegemonic power, hence sustaining the world economic order. When Africa was colonized, the organic growth of its socio-political processes were disrupted and or destroyed, leading to the successful capture of the minds of its people through restructuring their knowledge systems and erasing and or de devaluing their history, culture, expressions, and ways of being. The era of digital revolution launched in the late 1980s has given the imperialists even more power to reshape the world in more profound ways than had ever been imagined. This evening, I'm going to focus on some of the ways that the big lie is constructed and sustained, focusing on its implications for Africa. I will highlight some of the mechanisms and technologies of power through which universal norms are constructed and spread across the continent, and also talk about the politics of knowledge and the autocratization of global knowledge production and knowledge acquisition. How can we de democratize and decolonize the epistemic space? In which ways can we talk to epistemological apartheid? So following this introduction, I focus on five social structures to briefly elaborate on the mechanisms through which colonial norms and beliefs become embedded in hegemonic ordering. First, I talk about the formal education system. Second, I'll talk about the notion of time. Third, the theory of development. And then the concept of gender. And finally, the institution of the museum. My paramount concern is to demonstrate how Africa has been caught in the vortex of Euro-American globalized knowledge production and dissemination since colonization in the 19th century. Some of the insidious ways that the empire sustains its dominance in Africa through knowledge production will be highlighted as I also discuss ways that we can do, undo such hegemonic power. So I begin with formal education. In secondary school, my history teacher taught me all the fine details of the French Revolution, but neither the Haitian or the Algerian revolutions was co were covered in the syllabus. He also explained the Jewish Holocaust at the hands of Hitler's Nazis, but said nothing about the German genocide of the Herero and Nama people in Namibia that foreshadowed Nazi <laughs> ideology. The geography teacher exposed me to knowledge about the main islands that make up New York City, but not those of Lagos. Timbuktu was referred to in a disparaging and patronizing fashion as I was forced to cram the Ten Commandments of the European civilizing God, while simultaneously drumming into my impressionable young mind that the spiritual world of my people was evil witchcraft and paganism. I could go on and on. At Macquarie University, modeled on the best high learning institutions of Europe, I detested the professors who stood at the lectern and talked down to us. They separated and privileged theory over practice, thinking over feeling, science over the arts, masculinity over femininity. They distorted, minimized, and othered indigenous knowledges and experiences, and they dismissed our voices as students. To be inquisitive and contrarian was not only frowned upon, it was penalized. My experiences at school taught me several lessons, positive and otherwise. First of all, Africa needs to stop viewing the educator as the know-it-all teacher, but to use Paulo Ferreri's description as a dialogical co-investigator who learns with the learners. The main role of the educator should be to reorient the perspectives of students hone their critical thinking skills, and dismantle 
the reproduction of dominant ideologies. Freire emphasized the use of praxis, whereby teachers and students collectively engage in critical analysis of oppressive systems that dehumanize and marginalize. Remembering that the classroom and lecture room are at the center of Western thinking, it is important to supplement such methods through a return to African educational pedagogies, such as storytelling, social dramatic plays, folk song, parables, and poetry. Moreover, in most, uh, most of Africa, academic subjects, particularly in higher education, are taught through the medium of a colonial language. What Africa needs is an education that takes indigenous knowledge bases seriously and its context and is context embedded as well as empowering. Fanon fully understood that those who control language control reality, which is why Ngugi wa Thiongo and Chinua Achebe implored Africans to restory their realities in vernacular traditions. When it comes to research, those that dominate the knowledge production industry have also developed standards and criteria for what qualifies as legitimate knowledge globally. The blueprints for constructing truths are straight jacketed into conventional standards that serve the, the status quo. Thus, in order to make any scientific, whether social or natural sciences, any scientific knowledge, knowledge claims, your research must follow certain rules and the results have to be published in a specified written format. Traditionally, in Africa, theory was constructed through oral stories. In fact, practice, theory, and knowledge building were all integrated. In other words, life's meanings were explained through fables, myths, and spirituality. Kenyan Nobel Prize winner Wangari Mathai was fond of telling the story of how, um, as a child, she used to collect firewood for her mother. The mother forbade her from collecting wood from the so-called strangler fig tree, as it was the tree of God that was never to be cut, burnt, or used. In fact, her people worshipped under this tree. Decades later, as an unaccomplished environmentalist, Mathai realized that the sacred tree was preserved because it protected the highland soils from erosion and mudslides. Its strong, deep roots chiseled rocks to make underground springs that provided subterranean water for the villagers. When the colonial uh, missionaries and administrators <coughs> arrived in Kenya, they ordered most of these trees to be cut down for their representation of pagan gods. This story depicts the epistemic relationship between indigenous people and nature manifested through their spirituality and taboos. Wangari's people who had never been inside a Western type classroom understood climate change better than today's so-called experts. The story driven theoretical framework was more impactful than the alienetic, anthropogenic, global warming explanations being touted today. Stories do not have complicated jargon and opaque expressions and easily resonate with the masses. Yet such counter stories are viewed by the powers that be as unscientific and therefore flaky. This marginalization of different ways of knowing leaves no room for the cross-pollination of ideas. Theoretically nuanced stories have always been popular with feminist researchers, even as they, they are frowned upon and vilified by anonymous peer reviewers and mainstream, pu mainstream publishers and all all those critics that Caroline Nordstrom aptly refers to as the judges of epistemology. We must heed calls from scholars such as Linda Tuhiwai Smith to recenter indigenous ways of knowing and to decolonize methodologies derived from the oral traditions. As the epicenter of colonial indoctrination, the African university itself needs to be reinvented as a subversive, anti-imperialist, anti-sexist, and anti-capitalist and non-elitist space. The decolonized decolonial university in Africa 
should valorize the knowledge of indigenous artisans, traditional medicine practitioners, agriculturalists, ecologists, griots, musicians, and other local experts outside the ivory power of Eurocentric academia. The physical and conceptual walls that separate the university from local populations should be pulled down and institutional doors flung open for the community, remodeling it to the basic needs of Africa. A horizontal cross-pollination of ideas between indigenous knowledges and the relevant Western practice, praxis would resonate better with Africans than the vertical domain of neoliberal modernity currently recycled in most African universities. It is important for Africans to collaborate with critical thinkers located in the global north, as well as expand and strengthen South-South relations in its commitment to decolonize and liberate the continent. But such collaborations should be based on mutual respect and shared interest. It is quite common for Western-based scholars to treat their African colleagues as glorified informants. In such transnational intellectual division of labor, the latter are assigned the empirical tasks, while the former designate themselves as the theory builders. By forging and promoting alternative ways of thinking, Africa shall bypass the barriers of the intellectual gatekeepers and flatten hierarchies. Forging synergy between diverse philosophies and a cross-pollination of various geo-cultural perspectives, a dialogue between disciplines must be part of the counter-hegemonic global movement. Finally, on education, the academic publishing industry in Africa is too small, too insular and conservative, largely stuck in the colonial ways of doing things. The international bigwigs in academic publishing, such as Elsevier, Springer, Taylor and Francis and Wiley, have co corporatized knowledge production by taking over African academic journals and totally commodifying knowledge. Neocolonial practices that lock up knowledge, such as copyright and other intellectual property rights, should be replaced with open access, open access practices. No individual can claim to be the exclusive producer of knowledge. We all build on existing knowledge and all restate old arguments. Open access literature is key for a continent with limited resources and other challenges that result from colonial legacies. I turn to the notion of time. Most Africans have a difficult relationship with time as conceptualized by the West. In fact, the issue of the average African not respecting time is so notorious that the phenomenon is officially known as African time. <laughs> it connotes an overly relaxed attitude at best, but usually implies tardiness, delinquency, and incivility. We are made to feel shame towards our relationship with time, constantly being reminded that time is money. In his article entitled The Tyranny of Time, Iranian writer Joe Zadeh exposes clocks and the modern concept of time as math mathematical constructs that have been shaped over centuries by science and also power, religion, capitalism, and colonialism. Several scholars have analyzed time theories, including Marx, Emily Durkheim, and Barbara Adams. The standardization of time in the late 19th century forced the world into a common dating framework that perceives a separated past, present, and future. Indeed, key to the pro processes of universalization was the reconstruction of the concept of space and time. The homogenization and valorization of temporalities serves concise social, political, and economic goals. Time is a formidable scientific tool at the disposal of Western capitalism to facilitate the process of exploitation. Scientific discourse makes us believe that time is a neutral unit, but it's actually extremely political with signif significant implications for our revolutions as Africans and as feminists. Time boggles the mind, but typical of imperialism's attempt to control everything, it created the clock, which is frequently adjusted and altered to fit social political purposes. 
The best examples of time as a construct are the phenomena of a leap, leap day, a, of leap day additions every four years, or the daylight savings of time, whereby the hour hand is manually advanced on the clock during summer to allow darkness fall at a later time. Yes, the generic clock may be a practical tool for scheduling lectures like this one, but we must be alive to its historical social ordering of power relations in capitalist structures. Our anti-colonial and anti-patriarchal struggles are currently wrapped up in coloniality. <coughs> we are using the empire's tools and paradigms to dismantle the empire. We hold this false sense of arrivalism when we mimic the ways of the empire, including the concept of time. We adopt World Bank endorsed development programs with meaningless end years tagged on them, such as the African Union Agenda 2063, that so-called master blueprint that's supposed to move the continent towards structural transformation. Of course, such time-bound estimates will crumble in the face of the reality of the impotence of a disunited, balkanized continent caught up in the web of neoliberal globalization. Capitalism has turned most of us into robotic followers of abstract clock time. Our patterns of feeding, sleeping, resting, being productive are all counted against time. Time has been commodified and the clock is the capitalist's main tool for facilitating and regulating commercial relationships around the world. Gareth Dell describes such global synchronization of human purposes as slicing and pricing time for the benefit of capitalism. As a resource, capitalist logic views time as something that can be saved and or wasted, factoring it as a measure of efficiency. Hence, the capitalist enhances profit by saving time, basically disciplining labor and segregating it from other human experiences. Non-Western cultures had different ways of viewing time, which rhymed much more with nature. For example, all conceptualization of African time were, and in many ways still are, very different from the calibrations of the clock which add up to seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, periods, and eras. These Western ontological and epistemological frameworks of time are linear and progressive, whereas African understandings do not follow such rigid chronological measurements. They are circular, multidimensional, and constantly moving, moreover in a multi-layered space. Even today, the clock's tick-tocking is meaningless to most non-Europeans who conceive of time not as abstract chronological periods, but rather in more concrete terms as events and seasons happening in an interconnected world that has no beginning and no end. Time for Africans is not linear, but follows a spiral, which to echo Achille Mbembe is an entanglement of interlocking presents, pasts, and futures each age bearing, altering, and maintaining the previous ones. The empire frowned upon such contextual elastic conceptions of time and mocked them as irrational and uncivilized, and yet to them we must return. It is important to note that the relationship between capital, labor, and time is a gendered one. The long hours spent engaged in caring work by women in the so-called private sphere remain wageless and undervalued. Hence, the law is deployed to push time spent in the care economy out of the, product, the production boundary. But we know that it is the unwaged domestic and reproductive work performed by women that makes it possible for capitalists to profitably appropriate labor, labor time in the public realm. Africa needs to consciously bend time and space to match its ancient history with the present and the future. Africa's ways of being and doing have never been time bound, but have always enjoyed boundless and timeless spiritual connections between all humans and between humans and nature. Those ways are informed by the wisdom whose strength of spirit is drawn not from the human body, but from the cosmic order. 
Africa should resist the imperialist forceful severance from nature and the supernatural. It must continue to be one with ecology's enduring time. In short, Africa should beat its revolutionary drums to African time. Next, we consider the imperialist conception of socioeconomic development as time-bound, linear, and measurable. Like other neoliberal concepts such as democracy and human rights, Western hegemonic ideology firmly holds the blueprint of universal development that would supposedly lead all nations to attain economic progress, modernity, and civilized status. Modernist development, as conceptualized in the global capitalist political economy, references an increment in economic output. Economic progress is measured through gross domestic product, which is the value of all goods and services consumed. Students of economics learn that unhindered markets are ideal for economic growth and social welfare. It is all about investment growth and maximization of market share and profits. The state must retreat from its fundamental role of sustaining the economy. Such neoliberal economic theories valorize the market while simultaneously commodifying social relations, human bodies, and minds. The 2007-2008 global economic crisis was indicative of the economic, social, and environmental limits of neoliberal development policies. This hegemonic paradigm of neoclassical liberal economics has been mastered by most African national bank governors who have trained in Western universities to reproduce such paradigms. As a collective, they have successfully executed the imperialist agenda of firmly inserting Africa into the global capitalist economic system and deepening the continent's dependency and indebtedness. Multilateral capitalist institutions such as the World Bank and IMF, development agencies and transnational corporations are at hand to ensure Africa's total compliance with the rules of the game of finance capital. Indeed, the World Bank and IMF have been instrumental in universalizing these paradigms and integrating the world economy through globalization. But can true and substantive development ever be achieved in Africa under the bourgeois neoliberal democratic dispensation? Is free trade really free for Africans under the neoliberal capitalist structure? Is social and economic justice possible in a heteropatriarchal capitalist world system? Since capital under neoliberal conditions is accumulated at the expense of exploiting natural resources and labor from the least developed regions of the world, there have been attempts to counter the logics of neoliberalism and modernization. The World Social Forum, for example, emerged as a counter movement to the World Economic Forum. Regrettably, the World Social Forum failed to unite the Global South in these efforts as its agenda was more focused on de-Westernization than decoloniality. It simply sought to shift the political economic center of gravity from the Bretton Woods system to the BRICS alliance. The neocolonial knowledge systems informing the political economy of international trade would remain intact. This is quite different from, say, the Latin American notion of vivir bien, which means good life, that challenges neoliberal paradigms of development. Bolivia has started to implement the concept of vivir bien with a series of transformational processes to replace global development discourses. However, the country needs to address several contradictions of vivir bien if, it is, if Vivier Bien is to succeed. For example, without radically transforming its underlying political economy, the post-neoliberal era will remain discursive. Hence, it is crucial to dismantle capitalist colonial relations of production, including markets, extractive practices, export of natural resources, and dependence on finance capital. This points to the monumental challenge that the Global South faces in effectively, sh effectively shaking off the well-entrenched capitalist production relations and the colonial matrix. Vivier Bien, which is derived from 
communitarian indigenous knowledge systems of Latin America bears a striking resemblance to the African notion of Ubuntu. Bolivia's National Development Plan defines it as an encounter between indigenous peoples and the communities that respect cultural diversity and identity. It means to live well among ourselves. It is about communitarian coexistence without asymmetries of power. You cannot live if others do not. It's about belonging to a community and being protected by it, as well as about living in harmony with nature and sustainably enjoying its bounty. So similar to Vivia Bien, the African philosophy of Ubuntu gives more weight to the well-being of the group than the individual. The Ubuntu ethos of, a com of communitarianism and solidarity, usually expressed in the popular maxim, I am because we are, can be translated as the politics of the common good, also reflected in the notion of Vivia Bien. Ubuntu values unity in diversity and holds a lot of promise for human dignity, humaneness, and compassion. It is the same spirit with which I referred to you, the audience, as Banang. Hence, Africa can learn from the Latin American experience and revert to its indigenous ways of being and becoming human, to stop obsessing with material improvement and really understand that you cannot have a good life if people around you are not living well. In addition to ideological and epistemic transformation, Africa should also learn from the mistakes of Bolivia's economic transformational efforts. It is clear that neoliberal strategies such as structural adjustment programs, national poverty reduction policies, wealth creation programs, and so on, will only sink Africa deeper into underdevelopment. A successful decolonial link from colonial development modernizing models would only be achieved through a pan-African-led radical movement focused on uprooting the epistemic and material conditions of capitalist inequalities. In this respect, particular attention needs to be paid to the situation of women, which brings me to the concept of gender. The cultural systems that order African understandings of gender are so fundamentally alien to Western ways of thinking that they appear irrational. While colonial paradigms of gender are firmly founded on polarized dualisms of man, woman, African indigenous understandings of the same were more plural, pluralistic, more elastic and accommodating. Rigid gender dualisms create blind spots and stereotypes that result in social inequalities and injustices. For instance, intersex, transgender and other non-conforming individuals who do not fit into the neat mark sex markers of male and female end up being erased from, the, from state policies and subjected to multiple types of stigma and discrimination. Scholars of history and gender have challenged colonial gender tropes, revealing many examples from African societies where the organization of gender was not necessarily arranged along heterosexual or patriarchal lines. In her classic, classic book, Male Daughters, Female Husbands, Ifi Amadiume explains that biological sex did not always correspond to ideological gender in the Igbo Nobi community in southeastern Nigeria. In most African cosmologies, the dead transcend into the spirit world and live among the living as living ancestors. Ancestors may use any living body, regardless of sex, as conduits to exercise their agency through possession. This is why the equivalence of Western secular notions of transgenderism and homosexuality were not unthinkable in African ontological epistemic framings. The ancestral power of the Sangomas in South Africa and their full-fledged transgender statuses are but one example of this. Although patriarchy existed prior to the colonial invasions of Africa, its inner workings were quite different from those of Victorian era patriarchy, which was heavily influenced by Judeo, Christian, and natural law traditions, and philosophically defined by Cartesian 
that is dualism. The relative flexibility of indigenous gender systems made it possible for women to perform male roles in terms of power and authority over others. And because roles were not rigid, rigidly masculinized or feminized, no stigma was attached to breaking gender rules. Examples abound that exhibit such gender bending across the continent. I don't have the time to go through all of them. When colonialists arrived on the continent, they proceeded to impose their own conceptualization of gender onto African communities to fit into the imperatives of capitalist production and reproduction. Indeed, gender and the related concepts of sexuality and gender identity are intricately linked, linked with and pivotal to the capitalist accumulation process. Where there had been a fusion between the public and the private social spheres, colonialism proceeded to restructure spaces, clearly separating the market and the legal political structure that props it up from the domestic home. The dualisms are further entrenched in the corresponding binary characterization of the gendered spaces as productive, unproductive, waged, unwaged, self-interest, altruism. The foundational colonial construction of men as productive breadwinners and women as unproductive caretakers further creates a gender hierarchy that subordinates women. It did not resonate with most African societies where many women routinely engaged in trade, commerce, agriculture, and control of property prior to the interventions of the colonialists. With the colonial restructuring of gender relations, women's undervalued and unremunerated labor in homes, farms, and communities worked to subsidize capital by enabling it to cut the costs of maintaining wage earners, hence enhancing its profit margin. Feminist political economists, including Devaki J, have long challenged the opposition between production and reproduction, or market and non-market labor within neoclassical economics, which resulted into gender hierarchies. However, most of these arguments remained contained within the unchallenged framing of the gender binaries of heterosexual men and women. In fact, it is the queer renderings of postmodernist feminism that disrupted colonial gender binaries in ways that closely echoed the values that have long existed within many non-Western indigenous knowledge systems. Hence, the continent needs to rid itself of the colonial dualistic gender framework, which serves the heterosexist socioeconomic order of capitalism. Africa must reclaim the multi-gender and fluid sexuality frameworks that exist in many of its traditional cultures and rediscover its paradigms that relocate its people back to their cultural centers with a more egalitarian gender ideology. The relatively accommodating spectrum of diverse gender and sexuality identities is founded on the Ubuntu ethos of solidarity and interconnectedness. The non-binary gender constructions that reside at the roots of many African cultures are more sympathetic to gender inclusivity and hold greater promise for gender justice. The final exemplar of a colonial knowledge production site that I discussed this evening is the institution of the museum. Museums are not often viewed as colonial relics that actively work to shape knowledge. The African spiritual masks, bronze sculptures, glazed bowls, carved ornamental stools, complex works of art, dyed leather slippers, and other intricate objects on display in Western museums usually do not invoke feelings of an ancient civilization that goes back centuries. Rather, the objects are often curated in a way that conveys images of exotic relics of the inferior native other. They open the gazing eyes to differences built upon tragic hierarchies. Not only are museum storehouses of objects, but of knowledge. Knowledge that's classified to construct specific rationalities. Museums have, his have historically been powerful social political tools for shaping worldviews. Different forms of museums 
but particularly archaeology, natural history, and science, have served as pseudo-scientific projects of reinforcing racial and gender hierarchies and justifying imperialism. Ethnographic museums of the 19th century were particularly used as repositories of living exhibitions of primitive Africans for the free gaze that captivated the inquisitive European public. The museum represented the visual appeal of racialized gendered ideologies, confirming the pandered truths of the savages from the dark continent. A good example is the 1814 public display in the mobile pop-up museum on the streets of London and Paris of the naked Khoisan woman from South Africa, Sarah Batman. By so doing, Europe constructed her female body not simply as biologically different from the male body, but also as dimorphically different from the white female body and sexually less desirable. The personification of racialized gender per excellence. When she died the following year, Batman's pickled sexual organs remained on exhibition in jars at the Paris Museum of Man until 1974. The exoticized and strategic display of unfamiliar specimen and artifacts, when juxtaposed with normative European objects, does wonders in othering Africans and shaping the chilling imaginaries of the gazing European patrons. However, museological discourse is not limited to the displayed objects, but is further constructed through publications. Many of the big museums own publishing houses that publish regular journals, organize cultural heritage symposia, and so forth. For example, in 1963, the British Museum published Races of Man to complement its display of the Negroid and his close affinity to the Stone Age Grimaldi remains. School teachers take their students for museum tours as part of their history lessons. Images of artifacts found in museums are also reproduced in textbooks and web pages. In other words, Museums play an effective and affective role of developing Western identities and constructing knowledge about the other, those deviating from the Western norm. Michel Foucault characterized the museum as an enlightenment institution that serves capitalism and imperialism through a careful ordering of knowledge within an institutionally monitored space. Hence, we see the museum as an epistemic and methodological tool for shaping knowledge and understanding difference. The association between museums, anthropology, and archaeology, and later, later on eugenics, in constructing a history or story of the savage African and reaffirming racist ideologies has been well documented. Museum labels that freeze, decontextualize, and fragment a people and their culture, displaying African civilization as immobilized remnants of redundant pasts, facilitate the development of white supremacist ideas. Indeed, the macabre pocketing of assassinated Patrice Lumumba's gold tooth by a Belgian soldier falls squarely into the realm of such dominant thinking. The 21st century has witnessed a new type of museology that responds to post-colonial criticisms. A few have revised their curatorial practices, rendering them more sensitive to indigenous representations. Museum administrators have begun returning some of the artifacts that were looted from Africa. However, they do so with calculated resistance and racist patronizing coloniality, setting conditions for any repatriation. For example, President Emmanuel Macron of, of France demanded that Africa must have well-trained conservat conservators and guaranteed security as preconditions for returning the loot. Others, such as those holding the famous Benin bronze objects, will only return them as shared loans to Nigeria. In 2002, a consortium of eminent museums in Europe and North America signed the Declaration 
on the imp importance and value of universal museums, where they tried to convince themselves that they, they had a unique and sacrosanct duty to the looted and or illicitly acquired artifacts in their possession. The declaration represents the crisis that these historical institutions face in light of the extant pressures from former colonies to repatriate ill-gotten objects. A seismic paradigmic, paradigmic, <coughs> pride, paradigmatic <laughs> shift in the function of Western museums as knowledge-producing institutions. Now to conclude, until A is for Apple changes to the metaphorical A is for Africa, until knowledge is, is dislodged from its colonial roots and rerouted into African communities, excavating the wealth of African histories and experiences, the continent will never step out of the grim trap of neocolonialism. Radical changes of a revolutionary nature need to take place in African academies and knowledge production processes in order to achieve the epistemic rupture with Western hegemonic dominance. The deeply rooted colonial legacy of his epistemic violence towards Africa's worldviews and its people require a total reorientation of scholarship <coughs> and knowledge production. Given that knowledge represents the power of the dominant, decolonizing knowledge production challenges us to completely transcend the colonizing boundaries of modernist discourse and think outside the box freely and creatively to see outside the common and the obvious. Recently, many activist initiatives have spawned around the continent. For example, the South African Fallist Movement, the Marcus Garvey Pan-African University in Uganda, the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conservation at the University of Johannesburg, the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, the Africa Decolonial Research Network at the University of South Africa, and many more. It is through such processes that Africa can begin to facilitate interparadigmatic dialogues between critical indigenous and Western worldviews and experiences in ways that are ethical, respectful, and integrated. Unlearning Eurocentric thinking processes is our main challenge. Africa needs to take seriously its traditional epistemologies that were devalued and eroded by colonialism. Not only must we value theories developed out of formal academies, but also those that emanate from the unschooled. Africa should publish for its masses and not for the imperialists or the academic elite. Decolonized knowledge should thus take into account diversities based on gender, socioeconomic status, age, sexualities, disability, and so on, as well as all intersectional injustices. The continent should also caution itself about the risk of institutionalizing decolonial African thought as the new hegemonic power. The so-called specialized epistemic communities, communities should not replace indigenous knowledge. Processes of knowledge production must remain organic, constantly renewing themselves. Finally, the double-edged sword of technology holds opportunities for Africa's decolonial knowledge production. Technologies such as the internet, for example, present the continent with numerous resources for producing, communicating, and disseminating knowledge and information through multimedia formats, such as textual, visual, and auditory content. It is crucial for decolonial thinker, thinkers of African descent to discover each other and connect across the globe. So a Pan-African bid to fight off the Euro-American hegemony has also taken advantage of the digital revolution. Feminist Africa, the first digital feminist journal on the continent, established in 2002, is a model for many more to bloom. Let me end by saying that Colonialism is not the only story for explaining Africa's knowledge production challenges. While neocolonialism dominates the narrative of the story, 
it certainly isn't the only one. We have seen how colonialism maintained a tight stranglehold on the continent, making it extremely difficult to disentangle itself from neocolonial control. But beyond that, Africa can potentially open chinks in the neocolonial epistemic armor. Indeed, Africans possess agency to resist and challenge the deeply damaging colonial discourses. Sadly, most leaders are conflicted with their own state power and bourgeois pri privilege and corrupted into acting as the comprador agents of neocolonialism instead of working to lift their nations from its shackles. Thus, in order to overcome the Berlin-engineered balkanization of the continent and gain leverage over the hegemonic world order, Africa needs to establish a massive youth-led counterweight through a Pan-African grounds-up movement led by a clear decolonial ideology. Youth-led because they have the least to lose and everything to gain by changing A is for Apple to A is for Africa. Thank you for listening to me. fascinating, thought-provoking, and rightly challenging lecture. It's been fantastic to listen to. And I'm um, really looking forward to hearing questions, viewpoints, um, ideas from the audience. So please, over to you. Who would like to ask uh, Sylvia something from what she's said tonight? Um, please, there on the, the back row. And there's just a microphone coming to you, if you, you don't mind waiting for it for a moment. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I think you opened a lot of our minds and was really empowering. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion about responsibility and whose responsibility it is to kind of move away from this kind of colonial hold there is over Africa. Is it the responsibility of kind of colonial powers to... I guess the word used usually is reparations or to strip themselves of the privilege that has kind of arose out of previous situations or is, does it lie more in the descendants of Africa, African governments, etc., to take themselves, kind of take agency and remove themselves from the kind of where they've been left by colonialism and how far do you think these kind of two opposing sides if you I guess worked need to work together or act completely separately um, yeah I hope that made sense um, usually from experience we've learned that people with power and privilege are very reluctant to let go of that power and privilege so um, I think the responsibility lies with us to really to to free ourselves our, our minds, more than anything else, have been captured by the dominant narratives, the dominant discourses. And I think that is, that is the biggest challenge that we have. We need, because when you talk to many Africans, you know, the, the first thing they will tell you is, but that's against, the Bible says, those will be the first words that come out of their mind, like their mouth. The Bible says, it's been totally captured you know, and um, thinking in binaries, thinking what they've been taught since. And so it, it, that is the biggest challenge, really. It's the biggest challenge, the thinking outside the box. And what Bolivia tried to do, it is so difficult because we are, our economies are so entrenched in, the, in finance capital that, you know, extricating ourselves it's a huge revolutionary challenge. But I, I think the first thing we need to do is really understand what colonialism did to us, to our countries and to our minds, and decolonize our minds. And once that we've got clarity of that, I think it will be much easier. Especially, my hope is in you, the youth. It really is in the youth. I, I think um, 
once we, uh, when I wrote um, Decolonization and Afrofeminism, the audience that I had in mind was really young people like you. And my aim was to try and simplify how, what colonialism did to us. So I think the main responsibility lies with us. It lies, it's not with the, our lead, current leaders, because many of them, you know, they may, they may understand, but because, because they are benefiting from, you know, um, acting as agents, really, of colonialism, they are not going to do anything. So I think right now we need to raise awareness so that we all understand what it is and fight against it. What we learn from school, total rubbish. <laughs> you have a PhD, which is not helping your, your country in any way. All it's, all it's doing is helping to entrench um, our underdevelopment. And once you understand those things, right, I think then it, it will, will, things will fall in place. And yes, we can collaborate, as I said in the paper. We can col collaborate with, um, you know, non-Westerns non in the West who, who uh, are willing and understand, you know, that their privilege and power, you know, is exploiting, is at the expense of some other people in some other parts of the world, yeah. question and, and thank you for that answer and um, please stand here thank you very much for your um, interesting lecture um, it's, it's really interesting you mentioned uh, time in your talk and um, my, my question is double barrel so the, um, I want to know um, in your opinion how long do you think um, it's going to take Africa to actually uh, decolonize when you mentioned a for Apple, I could, I could resonate with that because um, I grew up in Ghana myself and um, I, I, I was born in the 80s and um, I also sang Nesri rhymes like Mary had a little lamb, the, the wool was white London as snow. Bridge is falling. And, <laughs> and, and, and um, that was uh, just not long ago. So I'm wondering how long it's going to take um, as to actually decolonize. And the second question is um, in relation to um, you know, human rights, um, things around LGBT. I know um, it, is, it is a colonial relic that has been in most um, African uh, constitutions. And I think it's, it's one part that they even hate to decolonize. They wouldn't want to decolonize um, that aspect of the constitution. So my question is, how long is it going to take um, the African continent to come out of, of this, if you have an opinion on that? Thank you. Well, it will take as long as we break those shackles um, and, and uh, restory and understand and decolonize our minds, basically. How long it will take? You're, you're looking at time in a linear fashion. <laughs> <laughs> it will take as long as it will take, but I think we, we, we are all responsible to begin the work of, of educating ourselves and understanding, you know, like that Mathai story, you know. Um, very simple, but very, very effective yeah. about climate change and so on. So how long will it take it? It's, it's how many of us understand these things and raise awareness to others um, in, 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 through blogs, through social media, through whatever it takes. So that you know these notions that have been deeply entrenched, that have become part of our common sense, that our eyes are open and we see that they're not for us. They're serving some other people in some faraway lands. And it, it, it really takes awareness. 
The second question about human rights. Yeah, the human rights are, you know, it, they sound very nice and they, you know, they, we have them in our constitutions. And my question is, we have, for example, Uganda has been, has been celebrating 60 years. Last week we celebrated 60 years of independence. And we've had um, human rights, uh, the, 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 what's it called, the human rights part of the constitution. What's the name? Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. It has be, it's had a Bill of Rights for years. It's had, you know, um, we've, we've had since 95, a beautiful part of our constitution that focuses on women's rights, very women friendly. My question is, has that changed anything on the ground? And the answer, the obvious answer is very little, if anything. So that tells you something. We've had the Bill of Rights, we've had the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the two covenants, the, 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 the specialized international human rights instruments on, for women, people with disabilities, beautifully crafted, very nice words. We have um, special repertoires and so It changes very little on the ground. And that must tell you there's something wrong with the human rights framework as we know it today. That just is common sense. There is something wrong. And what is fundamentally wrong is the origin the roots of how these human rights developed. They were not meant to protect minorities like black people, like um, uh, people with disabilities, people living with HIV, no. It, it, they, it, it, it's, it, it sprouted out of um, mercantile history to protect uh, merchants, to make their um, their trading operations you know, easy and so that they can interact with fellow merchants in a way. It it's really was meant for that and that is why when it was translated into, you know, to try to protect minorities, it, it just doesn't work because it is very individualistic in its outlook. It is very um, neoliberal in its outlook. And it, it's, it's simply, it's, it's just beautiful words. In reality, it's not. So we need to think of other ways of achieving justice other than through human rights. Because, and you know, I've, I've had many arguments. Don't throw out the bath water with the baby. <laughs> okay, let's try to, 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 to change and, and, and uh, to change the human rights. And I, I don't think that you can change the way that human rights work today and, and its institutions. It's the person on the ground, it's like law generally. Law is good as a basic, you need laws. But we've had, for example, the domestic violence law in Uganda for years and from in many other African countries. I can assure you that the situation of domestic violence has not changed one bit. So the law is very limited in its, it's very liberal because of its, how it, how it was, um, how it developed and, and, and what its uh, essence is about. So people, a few people, privileged people can claim rights through courts. Statistics show that in Uganda, for example, only 5% of that population um, uses the judicial system to, 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 to settle their um, disputes. Only 5%. The other 95% use other, for, for various, it's too expensive to hire a lawyer. It's, they, they live too far from these huge um, Eurocentric institutions that are totally alien to them. But we continue in law schools to teach the law that serves only 5% of the population and don't teach um, community-based dispute resolutions. That's colonial.
please. Are we there? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Oh, sorry, we should pass you in the microphone. You remember better than me, so well done. Thanks. Hello, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for your speech. It was truly refreshing. Um, my question to you is, what role do you think African diaspora ought to play in the decolonial struggle? And um, how should we position ourselves? Because just for myself, like, I'm originally Kenyan, but when I go back, they call me Mzungu, which means obviously white person. And so it's like difficult to sort of build a bridge of like mutual understanding when they still see me as the other, despite the fact I don't see myself as the other. Well, you, 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 live, you live here in the UK? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm sure you know your position in the UK very well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 It doesn't matter where you are as a, as a dark-skinned person. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. You are perceived in the same way. Mm -hmm. So I see that you're part of the struggle. The, the fact that back home they call you Amzungu is, is, is part of coloniality because of your accent, right? Yeah. But I think you should be very clear about who you are, where you stand, and, and, and your, your role is not different from the African of the continent. Thank you. Thanks, could we there's, go? There's a hand there, at the side. Yeah, we've, we've got quite a few hands, sorry. There's a, where did you want to go? This okay. side, you haven't oh, been yeah. this side. Okay, let's, let's can we pass the mic back, is that okay? Thank you for your thought-provoking presentation and I think pertinent as we sit here at the University of Oxford, perhaps the first ivory institution that separated the knowers from those who consume knowledge, the community from the elite. My question has to do with the research process. So in traditional research, someone would write a research proposal and then an ethics application and then would go through data collection and data analysis. And often through that process, you have the researcher positioned as the, as the knower and the constructor of knowledge. Meanwhile, the community they do research on is the object of research and often has very little say in the research questions in the first place. Often research proposals are drafted completely in isolation between a researcher and potentially a supervisor. So my question is around how, how do we decolonize this process and what are the insights of Ubuntu in this space? And then a second question, if there is time, is uh, you mentioned the work of Ifi Amadjume. Um, so how do we disrupt the narratives uh, of people who say that homosexuality is un-African and these tend to be often politically important people in our African countries. Okay, thank you very much. I think you're right, you're spot on when you say that the way we do research is very problematic. Mm -hmm. um, treating the people that give us information as objects and we as the knower. And um, that, that tradition is what I was critiquing. We need and then you go ahead and uh, get a copyright and get make money from what they have told you. So you, you're not, they gave you the information. It sh really should be open access. When, you, when, you create, when you're a creative writer and you've created, um, you know, you've written a novel or a script, uh, a film script, that may be different, although even those are based, usually based on, on experiences of other people. But I can understand that. But when it is an academic, an academic um, publication, you write a book or a journal, a journal article based on research that you have done, you're building on what others have done. You, 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 you're building on interviews that you have conducted, you're building, so it's not your knowledge. So that should not be commodified. And um, it should really be open access. 
So, um, how do we change the, the way we do research? I, I, as long as you're aware of those unethical practices, you know, involve, you know, I, I don't know how many times I receive uh, emails from colleagues in the global north, you know, they have this proposal and uh, I think the, the donor has said, you must have cross-pollination, so you must have someone from the south, okay? So we, they have this pro proposal which they conceptualized without me, <laughs> and there's one week to the deadline. Unfortunately, there's only one week, but we are attaching the proposal. Feel free to comment and change anything in, in one week. Drop everything you're doing, and but we want. Can you be part of this? You know, very very unethical. So the people. I mean, you can conceptualize a, a, a research question, okay, but you can you can um, pilot test it, and and, and when you find when you get your results, go back to the people where where you got the results from and so that they can, you know, validate and really show that that is what they meant to say to you and acknowledge them in your research. And there are other ways apart from these peer-reviewed journals that really act as gatekeepers. There, there should be other ways, at least in Africa, there should be other ways that we disseminate knowledge other than through this really get kept um, you know, publications that make it very difficult to disseminate and very few people get access to them. We must be very creative. That's why I think we must think outside the box and find ways you know, of disseminating knowledge other than through publications. And the second one was about, I forgot, oh, about uh, my Diume and the homosexuality, yes. We need to certainly do more studies, more research. There, there are ex so many examples, um, pre-colonial, even today, where you know women get married to women in African tradition. Many people don't know about that. You tell them and say, really? Uh, you know, the, the Nua of South Sudan, the Nandi, the Kikuyu, the Luo. The, we we have. You know, uh, in Uganda, for example, the Langi people, they have a no the notion of Odokodako, which was fully recognized and uh, allowed, these were like, for better, lack of a better word, effeminate males, that were allowed to marry males. And it was part of their tradition. But when colonialists came with their laws on sodomy and their religion, that Sodom and Gomorrah and, you know, that became the dominant narrative to this date. I'm fighting my sense of linearity around, around time. <laughs> Sylvia, would you like to take one more question yes, from, from the audience? Fine. Should, should we take the one from the lady in the hat? Is that Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for this lecture. Uh, my question has to do with your work on Afrofeminism and how young people can collaborate in advocacy, just like the issue happening in Northern Uganda. I sit on social media and I'm wondering what's happening and I want to join in, but how will you advise based on your work on Afrofeminism and um, how young people can use social media as an advocacy tool and not necessarily to serve the imperialist agenda. Oh, the, I, I see a lot of creativity on social media. Um, I think there's a danger in, in, in um, trying to explain very complex concepts and notions on how many words are limited to Yes, in 280 characters, it becomes very, very difficult. Someone who has no idea. 
but there are some creative, this morning I was watching a clip on TikTok where <laughs> I, I thought it was fabulous, I wish I had brought it, <laughs> where this um, eight-year-old brother and sister, maybe eight and ten, and the eight-year-old sister comes downstairs wearing uh, daddy's blazer coat and the brother is wearing mommy's dress and the, the, the parents are sitting at the dining table with guests and they ask him what are you doing and the girl says well I'm daddy so what do you mean you're daddy you're a girl this is her mom you're a girl you can't be daddy he said well I want to grow up and be like daddy and my, my brother will be a girl so that you know when I'm I get married and I go to work, I come back and put my feet up and, <laughs> and beat mommy and beat her and the, of course by this time the man is you know, very embarrassed and yeah I want to do that, I don't want to be a girl, I don't want to be a woman, I want to be able to beat my wife like you beat mommy. Small clips like that I think are very effective. <laughs> There are so many ways that you know you can you can send messages out using um, you can be very creative. Like TikTokers are very creative, <laughs> but you know we we need as Africa we need to stop thinking in terms of um, these colonial borders that were imposed on us in Berlin because you know. Uh, just dividing us into small entities. There is no way one country, even the most powerful economies in the continent, can sit down with uh, G7 and start negotiating anything. This, they have absolutely no leverage. But together, 54 countries on the continent, with all the resources that we have, oh, very, very powerful. But it's it's, they make sure that we always, you know, in our little ponds, the, the, our leaders sitting in their little ponds like frogs think that they are very powerful when there's really, um, they have absolutely no power working in that balkanized way. We need to come, that's why I'm, I keep emphasizing it has to be Pan-African. This effort has to be Pan-African. We must think, um, we try to erase those borders that were imposed on us. Thank you very much. Sylvia, thank you so much. I think you've, you've taught us a huge amount. You've challenged us all even more, <laughs> which is a very healthy thing. Our respect, admiration, gratitude to you has gone up a notch even higher now we know you're on TikTok. So that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for taking Oh, thank you.